thank you for a more gracious introduction than I deserve. But um, I've been really, really wonderful, uh, really, really excited to, to be in uh, part of Sonic Lab coming into meetings. So it's nice to see lots of familiar faces. Um, I've kind of been in the audience at, at different talks, so nice to see everybody again um, and get a chance to get feedback from you. And as, as uh, Nosh has mentioned, I am presenting some research that I did with Matt Smith and also Catherine Shea, who is a graduate student at Duke. And I'm going to give you a little bit more about my background. So I do do work on cross-cultural research. I do do work on knowledge transfer. And the real issues that I'm interested in with both is how very micro-psychological dynamics, dynamics at the level of self, cognition, um, uh, social comparison, identities, all of those kinds of very micro issues affect macro issues such as culture and, and how knowledge moves around in a, in a large organization. And I had the pleasure of getting to know Matt Smith uh, when he was at the University of Chicago um, in the sociology department. I was in the judgment and decision making group with the psychologist who was a graduate student in sociology and later in Ron Burt's macro group. I um, had a pleasure of getting to when we started um, educating me on network theory. Mm -hmm. And so I've been very, very interested in it, applying a lot of the ways we think about psychology to issues of networks. And you have already heard uh, from Ned a, a lot of the basic perspectives that we bring to, to the field of networks. I'm going to give you a little bit uh, of probably a little review and just kind of push me along if you've already heard something, but I don't know where our slides overlap and when they don't overlap. But, uh, We've shared all of our materials, and um, I'm presenting new stuff today. And that means a couple of things. First of all, it means that I'm off of my routine program, which I, I can spew the, the socioeconomic talk over and over again, but I'm going to be presenting new stuff. Um, so it's really good for me because I'm going to be able to get feedback. We're running this stuff. We are modifying our experiments. We're doing a lot of stuff. It's really in progress. Um, so it's really good for me because I'm going to be able to get feedback from you at a very critical point. It's not so good for you because I'm not as fluent. I'm probably not going to have answers to a lot of questions that, that you're going to rightfully have. And, and furthermore, um, the, the, the samples that I have are quite small. Most of them are significant or trending to significant. So um, I'm, I'm hoping we do have something to share with you and talk to you. So the, the research I want to talk to you about today is kind of a general topic, but Network psychology, and obviously Noosh and many others have delved into this field quite a bit um, already. But let me let me give you where we started our, our our thoughts about this issue. All of you have seen this uh, questionnaire before, and it's very familiar to people who study networks. And it's your classic name generator uh, item that you you see in network surveys. So I ask you from time to time, people discuss important matters with other people. Name five or six people, or name people who are the people in your social networks. And all of you are familiar with this, and you're all familiar with uh, a well-known problem with this uh, questionnaire. And the well-known problem with this questionnaire is, if I ask, if I ask you one day, you'll say Toshi, Ogilem, and, and Nosh, and the next day I ask you the same question, you may say uh, me, Earl, and, and uh, other people. Right? And so there's a real lack of consistency in, 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 in the surveys that you see in terms of self-reported networks. And one way to address or explain this lack of test retestability is to say, this is a methodological issue. And we know that people make errors when they answer surveys, they have failures of memories, and so we can say, this is a methodological issue. And what Kuhn and others who study uh, uh, paradigms and history of science have said is that when we find troubling data in our research, we often put those uh, errors under the rug and say, this is just a methodological error that we have bad participants. And we say we have bad participants because that's much more comforting than to say we actually have bad theories. Um, as well. And so our interpretation, the real event, the starting point of our research is that some of these errors we're seeing in our network surveys, they're not methodological issues. They actually signal theoretical issues. And these errors, these patterns of forgetting that you see, they're not simply random forgetting. What they reflect is a psycho 
ecologically coherent uh, uh, pattern of, of network activation. People don't simply um, forget their networks randomly. There's a psychological coherence to it. Entering the network survey is a psychological act. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, the many ways that, that there is a psychological act uh, of this. Well, why do we fail to um, kind of see the theoretical issues that, that might be underlying this, this, uh, this, this phenomenon? Well, part of it is that we carry around with us a network between that. When I say we, I'm, I'm saying scholars who typically, traditionally, kind of carry the, the paradigm of network research. We carry around blinders uh, about what a network is and how it changes. And the, the research suggests that people carry with them a kind of network. And when you see the way networks are inserted into our analytic models, it's often an independent variable. You have a large network, you have a small network. You have a tight network, you have a sparse network, right? And so the ways that we're thinking about the network, they're, they're very much enduring parameters, just like you carry around your gender, your education, your socioeconomic status with you. And so we have well, known theories for how networks evolve in gradual ways. So if I move to a new company, if I get married, if I move to a new society, okay, I can imagine how my network would shift according to these gradual processes. But we don't have as many dynamic theories of network activation. Um, Noj has, has written about dynamic models as well. And so what I want to talk about today is our dynamic constructivist model of networks. I know that's a little bit jargony, but I will try and explain to you what, what this means and, and how it fits together. So I think Ned has shown you something that looks like this. I just want to quickly review it. What we imagine is in the classic network research is networks are social structures, something that's out there, right? That the networks we carry, that they, they are social relationships, they are beyond what is I carry in my head. And we argue that networks are also cognitive structures, right? And very much in the same way Noah has talked about it before, these are our images of networks. This is how we think about our relationships to others. And as such, networks are knowledge structures in our mind, our mental models of relationships. And if networks are knowledge structures, what is great about that is that psychologists have theories about how knowledge moves and how knowledge moves on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. So not just a theory of stability, where networks gradually change over time, but psychologists can help us see some of the moment-to-moment -moment ways network is activated and shifts and changes. And in particular, Tori Higgins has a great review paper which talks about knowledge being activated. So if I have an idea in my head, sometimes it is primed, it becomes salient, it moves to the forefront of my mind. And that idea, that knowledge is going to play more of a role in my decisions, my, the way I operate. And in the same way, network knowledge, relational knowledge, can move to the forefront of my mind and shift dynamically as a function of the psychological state, the situation I'm involved in. So that's kind of the way we're going to be thinking about it. Networks as knowledge structures that can move in and out of, of consciousness in this way. What we'll also be doing, Ned has already shown you a little bit of this, Researchers often put the network as, as an independent variable. We can look at a lot of Ron Hurt's research, for example, classic research, which says that if you have this kind of a network structure open, you get these kinds of outcomes. You're more likely to get a job. You're more likely to get promoted, et cetera. So network is an independent variable. And what we are suggesting is, great, let's look at networks in that position, but let's move them to another position in our models as well. Let's put them in a dependent variable position. And in the dependent variable position, what we can really talk about is what are the antecedents, what is allowing, what is causing us to activate particular network structures, okay? So there's a psychology there that leads us to activate particular network structures. And the reason why we're able to, to get some traction on putting a network as a dependent variable is because we're using very different methods. We're not going to be showing you surveys and observational studies, which is the classic way networks are studied. We're going to give you experimental design. And the experimental designs are what is going to allow us to manipulate psychological states and then show you differences in how people activate their networks. So on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, 
they're going to activate networks in a very different way. I'm going to show you some interesting ways that that operates. Okay, so that's a theoretical perspective I, I bring to this research. And I want to just show you how this connects with some of the other work that, that I've done. I've done a lot of work in cross-cultural psychology. And the cross-cultural psychology fits with this in the following way. Very, very similar kinds of, of patterns of inferences we went through in cross-cultural research. If you look at Hofstede's classic work on culture, again, it's a big macro structure and it's stable, right? Asians are this way, Americans are the other way, okay? I'm Indian or American, so I'm this way or that way. And what all cross-cultural researchers know, same thing that network researchers know, we know that that is really uh, a gross oversimplification. We first of all know that there's biculturals, people who are Asian and American. What do cross-cultural researchers do with them? Typically, we throw them out. We say, that's garbage data. We, we don't want them to mess up our paradigm, so push them out, okay? The second thing we know is that the effects in cross-cultural research are not all that strong. So you look at Asians and Americans, there's very, very moderate individualism, collectivism effect, the meta-analysis by Daphna Oysterman showed this. So again, we kind of push that under the rug and go back to our bread and butter of individualism and collectivism. And the final thing we know in cross-cultural research is from Wendy Gardner's research and the research I was involved with, with Michael Morris and his collaborators, um, and Wendy is, of course, here at Northwestern, is priming. And so basically, if I prime an Asian to think about their Asian heritage, they're going to act a whole lot more Asian. Their culture comes out a lot more in the, uh, in the surveys that we, we, we engage in. So what did we say? We said, well, culture is a cognitive structure. These are mental models we have of our culture. They can therefore be dynamically activated. So if I prime you to think about a particular aspect of your culture, if I prime you to think about particular ideas related to your own identity, we can get culture to be stronger or weaker. Again, we move culture to the position of a dependent variable. So it's the same kind of dynamic models that we're trying to apply to network theory and, and make sense of, of that. So let me, let me show you some of the ways we're going to integrate network uh, psychology into the network research. And what I, what I have here is what we mean by dynamic. Dynamic constructivist. I mentioned that before. Dynamic means that networks are going to be shifting over time, okay? maybe even on an hourly basis. right? The, the, what does it mean to have a network in stasis? We're talking about networks shifting quite rapidly as there are these priors that may activate particular knowledge. So it's dynamic, shifting, changing. Okay? What do we mean by constructivist? What we mean by constructivist is that we are not seeing networks that are, that are in some stable objective reality there is perception involvement. We're seeing networks as we imagine them to be. And that constructive process is where our own individual psychology comes out. And I want to I want to tell you how we're studying this. And this is a theory paper that we have right now. It's a draft, it's ugly, and I couldn't distribute it. Um, but it is it is a paper that is in prep. And we are looking at three different kinds of, 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 of uh, psychological processes. One thing that we're trying to do is, how do you remember your networks? Well, what we know from Kahneman and Tversky is there are shortcuts or heuristics that people use to facilitate the processes of recall, and to show you some of those heuristics in, in the next uh, uh, slide, and you'll see how that could affect the patterns of network activation. Framing. What do we mean by framing? This was the classic uh, studies by Kahneman and Tversky. How I how do you happen to interpret your environment in a given moment? How do you happen to interpret who you are, your own identity at a given moment, can shape the way you see your networks? And then finally, ego comes in as well. And ego is what I want to see, okay, what I'm motivated to see. And that's where I'm going to bring in some of the research that we are doing right now on ethical behavior. When not only is our networks, perception of our networks shifting across situations, it's shifting based on what I want to see as well. And so we look at this motivated process that, 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 that affects the way uh, we see our networks. Okay, so let me show you some ways we can integrate judgment and decision-making research. And here, I don't have any of our own individual data to present, but what I'd like to do is I, I, I even like to talk to all of us about how we can, in this lab, we've collected lots and lots of data, how we can kind of start to think about how to use that data, reanalyze it, from a cognitive perspective. So this is, I, I put this up before, the classic name generator survey, right? 
looking back uh, over the last six months, who are the people with whom you discussed matters important to you? And our basic contention is that this question is fundamentally unanswerable and leads to all kinds of interpretive difficulties for a subject who's got to answer it. Okay. And when subjects are facing confusion, complexity, uh, in statistical inference, Kahneman and Tversky said what they do, we can't calculate, can't compute. So we use shortcuts, and shortcuts are heuristic. And just like we have these computational difficulties to deal with, we also have, in terms of understanding our relational complexity, we're going to use shortcuts. And so these are some quick network heuristics. And so what, I, what I've done is I've tried to pull out some of the very, very famous Kahneman and Tversky heuristics and see how can we use them to make sense of how people who are answering network surveys might, might operate. So I assume many of you are quite, you're familiar, a little bit familiar with network, uh, with, with, <laughs> that, that you're extremely familiar with, with judgment and decision making research. Let's do different levels. So let me give you a little bit of, of the, these, these concepts, which I think will be familiar once I quickly say them. First one, so, so this is the method, first methodological problem. We all know people forget their ties. Brewer has done a great meta-analysis on the amount of which uh, amount of ties people forget, who they forget, why they forget them, etc. But he doesn't give too much explanation of why they forget them. But he yields five numbers as small as you know ten percent of your ties people forget. He finds numbers as large as eighty percent of ties people forget. So really problematic uh, test retest reliability, and he has a lot of data on this. So a judgment and decision making reinterpret re reinterpretation of this. People are not forgetting their ties, they're using heuristics, and these heuristics change in different situations. So let me give you uh, a way that I might answer that question if I'm a, a, I'm a subject. I'm sitting there saying, who did I talk to over the last six months? And what I think about is who happens to be available to me. And the availability heuristic is I use knowledge if it is available, accessible to me, if it easily comes to mind. And the fact that it easily comes to mind doesn't mean that these are the most important people. This doesn't mean that I talk to them most frequently. It's just simply that they came to mind for a particular reason. And we know some cognitive reasons why certain people come to mind. One reason why they come to mind is because primacy and recency. Recency is the fact that you were the last person who I talked to. So Toshi was the last person, I, he, he was the last person I talked to on, on, on Friday night, and now I have to answer this survey on Monday, and so I put him down on my survey. Okay. Primacy is you're the first person I met, and so therefore you carry more weight in my analysis of, of who's, coming, who's coming up. The other issue is attentional bias. And attentional bias is the fact that certain people are more vivid to me. Okay. And the reason they're more vivid is not because I've talked to them more or they're more important, but of their demographic characteristics. And guess who sticks, sticks out a lot to people in, in, in organizations? Minorities. Right? And so Counter talks about if you're the only woman in a group, if you're the only Asian in a group, if you're the only African American in a group, you're going to command more attention, you're going to be more salient. So what we find very interesting about this is there's a whole extensive uh, body of research out there, Erminia Ibarra and others have talked about it, which says that minorities are really not very central in their organizations in terms of their networks. This research may be conservative because people are actually over reporting the extent to which they're, con they're in contact with minorities. So it actually may be conservative because they're not actually really integrated in the networks. So the availability issue is, is one heuristic or shortcut that people might use. Another one that, that comes up, and so we said there's errors that people push under the rug, and then the other thing that happens in paradigms is there's data that seems pretty irrelevant, and with the irrelevant data we ignore it. And one example of the irrelevant data in our network surveys, which we probably haven't analyzed, is the order in which you activate people. And so we all have this data in our network surveys. And the question is, to what extent, what are the patterns you're seeing, right? Am I activating people in order of closeness to me? Am I activating them in order of status to, to, in, the organization, in the organization? What is predicting the order in which we're activating these people. And the interesting thing for us in this one is that we all know from network theory that people tend to reside in cliques. People like to be in cliques. 
But what we find interesting is anchoring and adjustment in psychology would predict that people would be especially likely to report clicks. So, so people may be over-reporting the extent to which they're in clicks. So I think of, of, of Nosh, and then I think of five other people who are connected to him. So I'm naturally coming up with clicks due to the patterns of my memory, not the fact that I actually reside in a click. Okay? So I, I'm, I'm activating people in his structural position. The final thing that I want to mention in this piece, and this is the, the last part where I don't have data, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to just close this and then move to the other three sections, the other two sections I have, is substitution. And substitution is an idea in network, in, in judgment and decision making theories. If I cannot answer a question, if I can't make sense of a particular thing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to activate, I'm, I'm going to ask a question that's completely different so that I can answer it. So I substitute another question in its place, okay? So I don't know why I interacted with in the last six months, so I'm going to ask myself a different question. I may say, okay, who do I like in this organization? Who did I recently interact with? So people are actually coming up with really different questions because they can't answer that one question. And the question they come up with is going to be based on what happens to be primed, which I'm going to show you about. Uh, so you show you some evidence about next. Okay. So here's where I want to kind of put this set of questions together. So if these are heuristics. We all have this data. And my call to you would be to look at this data and maybe reanalyze it. Maybe we can get another paper out of the stuff we've already collected in terms of how do we, how, how are people, what's the order, what are the patterns there in, in what we're seeing? What are, what are the ways you could see people uh, calling to mind different people based on um, these shortcuts or heuristics that come to mind. Okay, so I'm going to move into some data a little bit uh, short, a little bit short. Okay, so here's the next psychological tool that people use. So heuristics are shortcuts. Framing is how 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 are there certain cues in my situation that affect how I perceive or construe the social relationships around me. And so the methodological problem we have, we all know in the network research is there's lack of within-person stability. You may answer your network survey today and you answer it differently tomorrow, okay? And the psych interpretation or reinterpretation of this phenomenon is people may actually be bringing different situations or different selves into a survey, okay? So I'm actually bringing a different person, different me, different identity into these surveys. So, let me show you how framing the situation can, can change things. So in this research that Smith presented to you, our finding was, and so some of you may have been here, some of you may not have been here, was that high and low socioeconomic status people activate very different structures of networks when they're facing threat. So the high status people are going out there and they're activating all of these broad, diverse networks, and the low status people are, they're under threat rather than reaching out to get a job, they reach inwards and activate these very dense clicks. And what does Kahneman and Tversky, what one of the famous ideas is prospect theory. And what prospect theory suggests is that people are going to have very different approaches if they're framing their reference point in a different way. So think about it. If we have, how can we explain our effects? We didn't talk about this in our paper in through reference point. For low status people, if the reference point is that Having no job is the reference point, right? I don't have a job, that's my reference point. They're, they're not in a risk-seeking mode, okay? So they may reach inwards, they don't want to take the social risk of reaching outwards. For high-status people, having the job is the, uh, is, is the reference point. And so if having the job is the reference point, what are people going to want to do? They're lost a job or they're thinking about not having the job, and so they're going to be now taking more risks to get out of that situation. People who are in a risk, in a loss mode, are going to be more likely to start to take risks. And maybe that's why they're willing to reach outwards beyond their network. So it's how they're framing the situation due to their reference points. That may be explaining the effects we presented uh, a few weeks ago. What I want to show you now are some priming effects, though. And what priming effects we have um, are, are the following. So how, how does the fact that I see myself in a different way affect the kinds of networks I'm going to frame or activate? So one thing that we are thinking about right now is 
gender. So if I prime myself to think about my feminine uh, identity, maybe I'm going to activate more women in my network. Maybe I'm going to activate um, tighter, denser networks that are associated with women. Maybe the same kinds of things with race. So we want to see how priming people's identities, making them think about their ethnic identity or their gender identity might lead to different networks. What we did in this uh, priming study that I want to show you is we prime people to feel in control or out of control. So they're literally bringing different selves into the, uh, into the experiment. We make them think about a situation where they're either in control, so they're bringing their confident self in, or they're bringing their, their less confident self. Think about a time you didn't have control. And the reason we did this experiment is to really follow up on the psychology of what it means to lose your job and how people might respond differently to that. So let me, let me show you what our uh, primes were. It's 60, 61 participants at U of C, and what we did was we had them do one of three, manip uh, three manipulations. And Adam Kulinski, who many of you probably know, um, has done this priming before, not with respect to networks, but of course with respect to um, more psychological dependent variables, such as how you see patterns in the world. So some people are primed to think about a situation where they did not have control, they had control over the out this situation. So how did you, I think I have it reversed here, whoops. Uh, so think about a time where you had a complete lack of control in a situation, how did you feel? So you have no control, right about the time you didn't have any control. <coughs> or another situation, other people, completely different set of participants are told, think about a time where you were in complete control of the situation. And a third group of participants was told, don't even think about you know, anything pertinent to control. Just think about your last trip to the grocery store. And so that's our control condition. Okay? So three different conditions, and nobody knows. It's between subjects. So you guys read the being in control. You guys read being out of control. And you guys are in a condition where you're not thinking about control at all. It's a baseline condition. So this is what we found in, in our research. So when we gave people... This, this control prime, we found an interaction where control and gender interacted in the following way. So this overall interaction tends to be, and I'm going to show you a number of graphs, it usually tends to be 0.05, less than 0.05, some of them are, are marginal, but there's going to be one uh, bar that is significantly different than all of the other bars. So let me, let me tell you what this is. So when women are primed to feel out of control, they're activating smaller networks. So fewer people are coming to mind. This is the number on this bar. It, this axis is the number of people they're generating. Simply a count of how many people they came up with on the name generator. And if you can't see this, this is kind of people who are in control. So this is going from people who are out of control, the men being out of control, our baseline in control, women out of control, baseline in control. Okay. And so the bar that is Significantly different from all the other bars is this bar over here. So when women are out of control, they are activating smaller networks. Okay, so fewer people are coming to mind for, for the women. The men, there's, there's, uh, as you would expect, it's kind of, I'm activating more people as I'm feeling more in control. The baseline is somewhat in the middle for for both of these groups. But for women, when you prime them to feel out of control, all of a sudden fewer people are coming to mind. Okay, so the question is. Why would that be the case? And here's the additional data we, we have on this. Oops, I'm using the wrong one. The additional data <laughs> is, who, who are they? This is, this is psychologically. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> what, what the different data that comes to mind is, so who are they thinking about different people? And in fact, they are thinking about different people. So we have measures of who they're thinking about in terms of their status. And these are a little bit small, but the key graph that I want to show you is over here. When women are out of control, they are thinking of people who are more likely to be superiors. And so these are the proportions of the people they're thinking about. So what proportion of the people you activated was, a, was superior to you? What proportion of the people you activated was a peer? And what proportion of the people you activated was subordinate? So all of these three graphs together should add up to 100% for, for everybody. But the women now who are in a situation where they're out of control, all of a sudden they're thinking about people who are higher status to them. Okay? When men are feeling in control or out of control, they're actually thinking about more subordinates. Okay? So the men tend to be 
in, in, in both of these situations, they're thinking about more subordinates. So men who are out of control are actually thinking about people who are below them, okay? Where the women are saying, geez, I'm thinking about the people who are above me. So the question is, why might it be the case that we find these differences in network activation? Well, what we did is we went back and we looked at what, what the men and women were writing when they were in the situations, within the crimes, okay? So think about a time when you're out of control. When we went back and coded what the women were writing, when women were out of control, their experience of being out of control was very social. They were thinking about, 70% of them thought about situations where there was somebody higher status to them probably dominating them, okay? So it was a very social situation of being out of control. When men were out of control, they weren't thinking about the social experience of being out of control. They were thinking of 40, only 40% 40 of the time were they thinking about that social experience. Other times, it would be something that is not social. So I, I got caught in bad weather. I got caught in, in I, I, my plane got delayed. Something that is really non-social. But for women, the experience of being out of control was really a social phenomenon. And when they're primed to think about being out of control, they are activating networks congruent with that social experience of being out of control, okay? And when we, and then we also looked at the status of the people they were activating. For these women, they were activating when they're out of control, they're more likely to be activating high status people, consistent with this idea of, I'm out of control, I'm thinking about the social world, the micro world of people who are dominating me in this way. And what we are talking about in this research is, look at our baselines. The men and the women aren't really all that different. Okay, so it's just like the, the data that we that Ned presented to you, where in the baseline, the the uh, high and low status people aren't all that different. Okay, the men and women aren't really that different. But put women in a threatening situation, you're out of control. You see them and uh, uh, imagine, come up with, activate a social world which is really constrained to them. And if they're imagining the world constrained, right? This is going to be a, a world we're living in, we're enacting, and it can create these self-fulfilling prophecies. Geez, I'm constrained, there's nothing I can do. People are, all the people in my world are there standing here dominating me. And so we are really trying to connect this idea to Claude Steele's research on stereotype threat, which is stereotype threat is just a psychological feeling of, geez, I'm threatened, I'm going to fail. And what we're saying is this is the social manifestation of it. I'm threatened, I'm out of control, and let me now create a social reality which is which is consistent with the, this, this constraint that I'm feeling. Okay? So the, this is this is what we're saying. And I'm really intrigued. This is not significant yet, but I'm really intrigued by our men who I think they are exhibiting some reactants here. We tell them they're out of control and they actually behave just like the in-control people. They activate large networks and <coughs> networks with subordinates. So they're responding, um, by re but that's just kind of trending. But the gender data is, the women data is significant. Okay? Thoughts or questions on the, on the data? So again, this is, the network is stable. We prime people, we, we bring in a different sense of self, a different level of confidence, and here they are generating different, so it's a psychological state leads to a pattern of network activation. Okay? Now, I mean, is there yeah. a sense, sorry, uh, sorry, how long this effect lasts? I think it was how long your talk is going to last. How is that the next question? <laughs> I mean, is there, I mean, is there a sort of latency issue or a decay issue that after you find them that this effect will continue for a period of time? You asked them this in, in an experimental situation where imagine that they were asked to do this quickly after the, after the final break. Yeah. So this is a really good question. It's, a, it's the deep question that people ask all our primary studies in psychology. So from uh, John Barge's work onwards, where you get these this really cool effects where you know I prime you to think about being old, and then you see young people walk like old people, right? So the question is, are they going to do that for a week, a day, or just as they leave the lab? And I have not timed it, so I don't have the empirical answer to this question. Like if we bring them back in the lab, the next day, will that will that affect it? I haven't timed it. We haven't looked at the data. But my my the, my answer as a psychologist without the data to, to back it up is is the following: as long as that knowledge structure is somehow salient, okay, as long as something in the situation has brought that that, that idea to mind, it's going to have power and going to control the mind. 
So the, the minute that another idea uh, envelops it, and so so I prime so I prime you to not be confident, and then I prime you with something else completely different. So I prime you with your family or some kind of social support. Then you might see that uh, that other right that other idea comes to the forefront of the mind and it recedes. So so it's really is it psychologically accessible at the moment? So it's it's I I like but it, and it could be it could I could see it lasting over the next day if I come back in the same situation thinking about the experience I had before then it's accessible again. Okay. Yeah. But but the but everybody everybody uh, in social psychology is scared of that question or for because they they're they're not really good uh, quantitative answers on that. Okay. So let me let me show you some of our motivated attacks, and this is what I entitled my talk. And um, a lot of data I'm really, really excited about it. So Catherine Shane is a graduate student at Duke, and she's absolutely brilliant. And I got a chance to meet her. Um, I was hosting a doctoral roundtable at Academy of Management, and we sat together and we designed these studies for the whole academy. And so I, this is makes me really happy because it was actually a productive use of academy for one. Um, and uh, so the, the 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 study has only been alive since um, since August. So it's still in development phase, um, as it were. So here's here's a, another known methodological problem in our our research uh, in networks. So not only is there within person uh, uh, lack of stability in networks, there's also between person lack of stability. So I say no, she's my in my network and. He's writing out his networks and he doesn't even put me in his network. Okay, and so the psychological interpretation of that is maybe there's a little bit of wishful thinking on my part. So people don't report the networks that they have, but they are re reporting the networks that they want and the networks that they need. Okay, and so our goals, our cycles, so we're skewing it. So it's not just situations that are shifting the networks. We're skewing it, but we're skewing it in our own favor as we want. It. And so. Um, we, we know in the network research that people are over-reporting their contacts to high-status people. So I'm, uh, so I'm going to kind of say, oh, I'm not connected to those below me and those above me. Yeah, yeah, I, of course I'm connected to them. And they won't report connections to me. So this is not egocentric networks. This is kind of looking at the complete networks and looking at the patterns. And so we can look at our patterns that we see of asymmetries in our non-egocentric data and kind of see what are the systematic reasons why those exist. Now, uh, there's the, the paper that I want to show you is a little bit on how this wishful thinking emerges. And I want to talk to you about goals and how the goals that I have to have active, psychologically active at a time, are going to affect the way I shape the networks. And I'm going to use the case study of unethical uh, behavior here. So the question is, how do we achieve our goals? Okay. And so when psychologists think about goals, we think about it as a very individual phenomenon rather than an interpersonal network phenomenon. And so what I say is, I've got the goal to not eat all that chocolate that's sitting around, and so I'm going to control my temptation, regulate, and then I'm going to get this good outcome. But the other way we can think about goals is there's an interpersonal process as well. I don't want to think about all the, the eating that chocolate, so I activate all these skinny people in my life who, who, who and then, and we're actually studying this. With, 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 our, with our research. Um, and so then I'm going to get, so I'm activating certain kinds of people, and then I'm going to get particular outcomes as well. Okay, so my goals are tied to, to, to this. Now, we're going to show you a little bit of this evidence that our motivations affect how, the, how networks are activated. And what people are going to do is they're going to selectively activate certain subsections of their network. So I may have a network which is, as Matt had talked about it, potential network, parts of that network are going to be clicks, parts of those networks are going to be much more sparse, and when I need to do things that, that are ethical or not, maybe I'm going to activate strategically particular subsections that are going to facilitate my behavior and allow me to complete my goals. So when we think about unethical behavior, I'm going to give you the quick way that a lot of people have talked about it. One thing that we, we do is we focus on people, okay, and so a lot of the research initially was on people. And we see all of these, this, this, these people, we say, what were they doing? 
And it's human nature to make a fundamental attribute here and focus on individuals. And we say, we know from the research that self-interest uh, causes us to engage in these uh, unethical behaviors. We know men and people who are characterized by Machiavellianism, they are more likely to engage in these behaviors. We know uh, cognitive, uh, individual cognition, where um, my ego is depleted. So I'm exhausted, I'm tired, so I just cheat a little bit. I, I'm morally disengaged. I, I, I'm not really um, engaged with, with, my, my, uh, uh, with these things. So there's lots of individual psychological reasons. Well, the Milgram experiment comes along, and people started moving away from individual level causes and said, so let's focus on situations as well. Okay? And with situations, we, we've seen how group structure can affect your propensity to behave in, a, behave in an ethical or unethical way. And then also these very, uh, kind of, I'm supposed to say silly, but uh, the kind of very subtle manipulation with respect to the context. So if I give you dark glasses, Francesca Gino and Chen Bo Zhang. Uh, show that um, you're going to behave more unethically. So just wearing sunglasses, or if I get you to clean your hands, right? So you, you see that people are going to be, want to be more pure and, and, and are less like. So very subtle situational behavior, measure, uh, manipulations, which have really nothing to do with individuals. What we're interested in is not just issues with respect to personalities or individuals. We're not interested in even in situations. We're interested in the construal of the situation. How seeing a situation, perceiving a situation, or even creating a situation is going to create an act and a law for unethical behavior. And so we argue that all of those people that you've seen, that you saw, Martha Stewart or um, Mida, all these people certainly had an illusion of invulnerability. They thought they could get away with it. And what our contention is going to be is that the reason why they, they, they make this they have this overconfidence is because they activate a subsection of their networks which fools them into thinking they can get away with it. And that's an unconnected network structure, a sparse network. And so we're going to look at how social networks affect unethical behavior in, in these studies. So the arguments, you've heard them before, right? We imagine that a criminal is at the fringe of society. Right? Unethical people, they're, they're kind of not integrated in our society. They're sitting at the fringes of society. George W. Bush said, we'll find those who did it. We'll smoke them out of their holes, right? The, the Al-Qaeda people, they're not living in the center of power. They're living in, in some hole in the middle of nowhere where nobody can watch them, monitor them, uh, etc. Nathaniel Hawthorne said in the Scarlet Letter, if you're, if you're a pure person, a pure hand needs no glove to cover it. So they can stand out in society uh, rather than hiding away in some corner of the world. Okay. So unethical behavior. These are these are uh, these are intuitive impressions, but also the theorizing about unethical behavior. So just the same thing, which is sparse networks lead to unethical behavior, right? So unethical behavior is theorized in some of these uh, I, uh, review papers to occur in more unethical, uh, in, in in sparse networks. Michelle Gelfond has recently done a paper in science, which has been a really interesting way to think about networks and culture together. And she's a University of Maryland psychologist, and what she finds is that people who are in tight social groups, okay, who, who are in dense, interconnected networks, they're more likely to be monitored, feel monitored, have tight knit social norms that prevent them from deviating. And she actually looks at crime rates in societies, she looks at the harshness of punishments as she finds that people who have these tight-knit norms, not network structures, but the tight-knit norms, they are less likely to have capital punishment in their society, they are less likely to have um, uh, the crime in their societies, um, more like an authoritarian government. So these, this, is, this is what she finds she ranks all kinds of cultures. Uh, I think Pakistan is number one, India is number two, Malaysia is number three. All the cultures that I'm associated with are all in the tight-knit uh, areas of, of the world, right? And so tight-knit groups are able to, um, uh, to control deviation in this way. So our logic is that if you have a tight-knit group, you're able to be monitored. Okay? You're able to monitor and be monitored, and that's not going to be conducive to engaging in common normative behavior. If you're in a sparse network, you can feel a little bit more autonomous, right? So Ron Bird has talked about this. You have more autonomy, you can have more freedom, you're going to be able to violate norms in a little bit more flexible way. Now, 
what we are going to, so, so this is uh, just a quick picture. I don't think I need to talk too much about it. Dense network um, is going to lead people to be more likely to be caught. Everybody's watching each other. Everybody's talking to each other. Tight and extended family. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing versus a network where you and you can't put two and two together. Okay? So what we are going to be able to do is to not theorize about this, and not show correlational evidence of this. We're going to show experimental causal mechanisms here, where networks are both causing cheating. The network structure you are randomly assigned to is going to cause you to be a cheat. And the networks that you activate when you're cheating are going to be different. Okay, so I want to tell you how we're going to do this. We're going to look at two causal directions here to establish this link between your social structure and your propensity to violate ethical norms. So in our first experiments, uh, 1A and 1B, we're going to show you how network activation, I'm going to either activate a, a dense network, a dense subsection of your network, or sparse subsection of your network. And we're going to look at how that leads you to cheat or not cheat. Okay? So uh, uh, experimentally priming it is going to lead to, does it affect rates of cheating? Experiment two is going to be when people know they have to tell a lie. I'm going to tell half of you, guess what? You get to be honest, okay? And half of you, you're going to anticipate the fact that you have to tell a lie. Okay? You're going to have to lie to the next participant. So we are going to see what kinds of networks you activate as a result of it. And we're going to argue that you're going to activate a very different kind of network that's going to facilitate your ability to lie. Okay? So let me uh, show you our first uh, study here. We have just 43 participants, and we put them in these priming conditions. Okay, so this is still running in our lab, but we have significance already. So I want to report each of the three studies so you can see how they're going to be merging. So 43 participants, half of you are told, think about a, a sparse subsection of your network, and show you the prime exactly in a second. And you're going to be told, imagine a dense part of your network. Okay, then you're going to do um, an unrelated task. And that unrelated task is going to allow us to assess your likelihood to cheat, okay? And typically, 20 to 30% of people cheat on this task. So we have a baseline for that. So here's our priming. So we go through the name generator, but we do it in a different way. So we say, I'd like you to name somebody who you think is important in your network, okay? So you name one person. Then I ask you, think about somebody who doesn't know person number one, okay? and write their initials here. Now I ask you, think about somebody who doesn't know person number one or two. So you basically generated that loose subsection of a network. And so our argument is, it's not that you have an actually different network. You've just been randomly put in a condition where your those network nodes are salient in your mind. Okay, So we can really have a causal inference here. That network is now salient in your mind, so it's just going to have different monitoring effect as compared to all of you. And you guys are going to be put in a different condition where we're going to have you embed yourself in a clip. So do the same network survey, and I'd like you to think about um, a person in your network, then think about a person who knows person number one, and then next person think about a person who knows person number one and two. Okay? And so we go through it five times. And Ned and I are working on um, kind of looking at this crime, analyzing how it works, so we can kind of really use it to get some causal inferences about how networks have causal role in producing behaviors, psychological attitudes, etc. So here's our cheating task. Our cheating task is this matrix task. And we, we got the task from um, Dan and Ariely's team. And you got to do a math test. And so everybody loves math, right? And so math is fun. And uh, what, what happens is you've got to find your answer, whatever answer you come up with, on the matrix. Okay? And we set it up so you have your, um, your name, and your payment sheet is going to be one page, and your answer sheet is another page. And we have people detach those sheets, and so they believe they're completely anonymous. And in fact, what we do to make to ensure they feel anonymous is to we stuff the garbage with other papers. We have them running groups, so there's lots of people in the room. So they're thinking, there's no way those experimenters could ever figure out that we could match their names to their actual payment sheets. But we are really tricky in psychology, and guess what we have? Every participant has a, um, has a unique identifying number on that matrix. And so that number on their matrix can be matched up with their name on the page. So we can see 
did you, what did you actually get on your uh, math test, and what did you actually score? So did you overpay yourself? And so overpayment is going to be our measurement of cheating. And we even give them a break. So we said, if you make one mistake on scoring your math test, we, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a pass on that. But when we see more than one mistake, you're a cheater. Okay? And so this is a dichotomous measure of did they cheat or not. And this is just a, a, a two by two, uh, just sorry, not a two by two, just a one uh, measure. So we look at their activation of dense networks and their activation of sparse networks. The people who are activating dense networks, as you can see, are much more likely to be honest. This is our honest bar. So this is the number of participants. This is just a straight number of participants who actually cheated. And so you can see the dense people, there's much more honesty. The sparse networks, you've thought about people who are not connected, who can't put two and two together, the cheating, the rate is two and a half times higher. And that is that is already marginal at, 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 this, at this point. And what is interesting is the question is, why, why do they cheat? Oh, I don't, I thought we did, okay. Actually, we didn't, uh, I thought, okay, so I didn't think I have that there. Okay, so the primary, whoa, 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 I fell into something. Okay, so, <laughs> I fell into a fringe of society. <laughs> so, um, I, I, the priming of the network affects the behaviors. The dense, the sparse network is increasing cheating. So, that's the straight main effect that we find here. Now, um, a question that often comes to mind when we've presented uh, this work before, is that people ask, okay, so why, why, uh, why did you get this effect? I can imagine there's certain kinds of, 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 of times where a dense network is actually going to lead you to cheat, right? And so an uh, example is the mafia. They're a pretty tight dense network. Al Qaeda are pretty tight, and they're not behaving especially ethically. So what is what is the the issue here? And so two things we don't have control over in this experiment is. Are they activating an honest group or a dishonest group? So if the group, the dense group is dishonest, we're talking about counter-normative behaviors here. If unethical behavior is in fact normative for the group, then we should not see this kind of effect. And the other issue is, what is the kind of unethical behavior that is engaged in? And so the kind of unethical behavior that is engaged in in our particular experimental design is self-serving behavior. Right? So I'm going to cheat so I can get 50 cents more and buy an extra bag of chips, right? That's what they were getting paid. So you need to answer the answer. So I, I, I certainly don't want my close friends. I don't want Sani to know. I don't want Soyana. Those are my close friends. I don't want them to know, geez, Tanya went and cheated for this. Okay, so that's maybe why we got our effect. So we wanted to run the study to, again uh, in a different way to really manipulate whether I'm cheating for myself or for my group and see if we can get a reversal on these effects. So that is our experiment 1B. We did the exact same manipulation where we either activated people to think about their sparse networks or their dense networks, and this time we also had a control condition where we just saw what their baseline report is without any um, priming in this way. Then what we did is we had them make an ethical judgment about a scenario. And the ethical judgment about the scenario was the following situation. And there's a manipulation within there. So not only do you have your dense or sparse networks, you additionally are either going to have an, an, an opportunity to cheat as an individual for yourself or for the group. And so the first uh, example is you're at a restaurant. You're out to dinner with a, a group of friends that's a expensive restaurant. And the opportunity you have here is the following. Either you can cheat for yourself. And so this group of participants is told, you know, you, you've ordered a very expensive entree you discover the waiter forgot to charge you for your entree. And this has happened to you before. What do you do? Do you speak up? Your bill is going to be much, much lower than everybody else's bill. Do you speak up um, and, and, or not? You, and then, in fact, you leave the restaurant paying far less than you should have. The people who are going to cheat for the group get a very different scenario. And so the, the friends are going to be splitting the bill evenly, so it's not by person. And the waiter forgets to charge the whole group for the entree, thus your group's bill is significantly lower than it should be. And so you and the whole group, so by not speaking up, you and the whole group leave uh, having paid more <coughs> than, than you should have. And our measure of morality, this is perceptual, unlike the other study where we can say you actually cheated, 
or not. This is really how do you judge ethical action. And so what we did was we wanted to see people rationalize it. And so the most unethical people are really very, very good rationalizers. So we had a lot of fun coming up with a whole lot of ways people might rationalize this unethical behavior. So we said, <laughs> you win some, you lose some, except the lucky breaks and you get them. I've been overcharged before in the past, so it's okay to pay a little less this time. The waiter's fault, blame the victim. She was not careful enough. Um, the restaurant has made a lot of profit anyway, um, and we can add a little extra gratuity. So we, we can see the extent to which people are willing to agree with these uh, statements. And these uh, uh, propensity to rationalize, this forms a nice scale of, uh, which is highly correlated. And this is what we find in, in this experiment. So the control is kind of, I think people are um, more likely to rationalize cheating for themselves and the group. Okay. In the sparse condition, again, what you're seeing is people are going to be rationalizing away. This is the amount of rationalizing. Cheating for the self is more than cheating for the group. Okay, So they're more willing to engage in, just like in the other study, unethical behavior for the self. And we get the flip for the dance network. And so in the dance network, I'm thinking about my girlfriends over there. We're out to dinner, and I'm now saying, okay, I'm going to cheat for them. It's for their, and, and I'm more likely to rationalize it. So the type of cheating does seem to, to matter. In, in, in this. So that is our study 1A and 1B that, that go together. If I prime particular network structures for you, it's going to affect the way in which your propensity to, to cheat or to agree with um, unethical actions. Okay. Um, and, and so what we find uh, trending in, in terms of moderation is the closeness of the people. So that people, as, as we know from the research, People who activate dense networks, those people tend to be closer. And if we put the, the closeness scores in, that ends up kind of predicting it. People, I'm very close to them, so I, I, I want to live up to their uh, goals as well. And so we also assess the honesty. People in the dense networks are actually activating people who they consider to be more honest as well. Now, let's say the uh, let's flip the causality here. So we looked at network structure, does it predict behavior? I want to show you the reverse causality as well. Thank you. So you, you could have a um, compounding effect if, if some of the people uh, that fell in one group or the other um, had that kind of compassion about themselves or if they have been primed in, in some way to think of, of themselves as being sort of higher status than, than the rest of the participants in the group. Was there any measurement to kind of try to get at that to see if, if that could have, have any impact on the group? Okay, so a few things that we should, we will say here uh, as well. Okay, so that's a very interesting point. So what you're referring to is Adam Galinsky's work, right? So Adam Galinsky's work over at Kellogg is if a pro people who have power, they can prime to imagine themselves with power, they are more self-interested, they don't care about other people, they're doing all of these unethical things. So Adam would say, so, so we would kind of put that in kind of more of those individual ways, not done a network process, an individual way which that, that could be affecting these processes. So first, so very interesting point. Second thing that we will say is that we, we're not so worried about some kind of error that is going to be system. We don't think, if there's error that you're talking about, we don't think it's systematic. The reason we don't think it's systematic is because we have an experimental design. And so I randomly assigned you to experience um, a dense or sparse network. Okay, so I randomly assigned you to, to do that. And so if it's been randomly assigned, there shouldn't be kind of a systematic process. I think maybe we can assess whether, you know, maybe the people in sparse networks are thinking of networks where they are more higher status. Um, I, didn't, I haven't seen such a thing in, in that. Okay, but here's, but here's the way I think we would build on your research. This is what I think. I thought about this question and what I think is going on is exactly this. I think the higher status people are going to be the most quick to do this kind of stuff, especially the next study. So what I think is when high status people prepare for unethical behavior, they're going to be quick to come up with networks where they're saying, I don't have to worry about you. I'm going to quickly activate a network where I think I can get away with things. And I think that interaction would be interesting. And the experimental design we do is we prime status, power, and then uh, and then the unemployment. And I think I think the powerful people would be very quick at, at, at 
respect imagining these worlds. So they seem to be getting into a lot of trouble. Uh, so maybe a mechanism uh, uh, for that notion. So the, the, there is work going back to the mid-1980s by Seymour Sudman, where they looked at recall on networks. And what they found were they, were some, they found some systematic, not a lot. One is that people who receive a lot of communication underestimate their communication, systematically underestimate. And those who don't receive much kind of communication systematically overestimate their communication. In terms of individual characteristics, they found that people who are a higher status yes. um, also um, under, underestimate uh, their communication. They have older respondents, people with higher status, people who have been with their company for a long period of time. So this was in the organizational context. This is Seymour Sutton. Sutton, S-U-P-M-E-N. I just, okay. I just sent you the site. Oh, that's great. Because we have the Brewer site, and you made the site of the but we don't have the Sutton yeah. site. So they didn't find any difference based on gender. But okay. then that's because, as you pointed out, your difference in gender came about because of timing, not otherwise. So in fact, I think you showed that otherwise there wasn't a difference. So, uh, so that was another one in that area. And that Weber also, back in the 1970s, did a study where he looked at superior subordinates and found that subordinates systematically uh, underestimated the amount of communication, uh, sorry, uh, overestimated the amount of communication and superiors underestimated. So the same superior subordinate the supervisor subordinate died, there was a systematic difference between the, the subordinate saying, well, you know, this person, my boss never communicates with me, and the boss saying, oh, I communicate all the time with that person. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> they so, so that, that's interesting, though, because it's the opposite of what we were saying. Because yeah. we were saying, so we were saying that people would over-report the context with high-status yeah. people. So maybe they would over-report the context with high steps people who are not their direct right, boss, right. or their direct boss is saying, oh, they're not managing me well. And I'll, that but it is consistent with your uh, earlier slide where you said people don't report the actual communication with what they want or what they need. What they want and need. And so if they need more communication, then they're going to, uh, as, a, as a reaction to that, say, well, they're not getting enough. And, and so that may be part of the reason why that could happen. So anyway, I just thought about this, but the status finding was one of the, in terms of recall. Yeah, so, the, so I, 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 the Brewer paper that we looked at had yeah. a lot of uh, meta-analysis of all these errors and what they find over and over again. I haven't read the stuff, and I think Brewer has a lot of the same kinds of, of, of uh, sites, but maybe his was, uh, is this a more recent one? No, the Seymour is 1985. 1985, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, interesting. The other piece of work that I'm not sure you're familiar with, but it's done in the field of communication, uh -huh. is uh, Steve Corman and Scott Blue. Mm -hmm. And Greg Scott had an article that came out uh, in 1994, okay. I sent to the site, uh, where they argue that this, uh, that it's active, they don't use those, they actually they use the word sort of activation. They base it actually on activity focus theory, Scott Fells theory. They say that what you remember is activated by the um, kinds of activities that you're involved in. So that if you're involved in a certain activity, you're going to activate different networks. So they, they have a, what they call a reticulation, activity and reticulation theory or something like that. And that's it's, very it's specifically yeah. uh, with what you're talking about. So I've sent that. That's, that's well. very, very interesting. Yeah, because if they're yeah. in that activity, it's, a, it's being primed in this way. One of the things that we are trying to work with and think about is kind of um, subtle priming. Yeah. So it's not just that I need, I, I'm, all of our studies, one of the things is I'm not just telling people you are going to get engaged in a non ethical behavior. What kind of network are you going to activate? We always think it is not, this is really unrelated. So we kind of just wanted, gave us ourselves the most conservative test. So it's not that I'm thinking about these networks for a real conscious purpose. We They, they don't even know why they're doing it. We told, we told them there's one researcher at Duke, another researcher was in Northwestern, and yeah. they're doing different studies. So what is interesting is there may be, and I think we should study this and look at it, which is when you're doing something for the purpose of it versus like in the activity, and it's very obvious, hit them over the head and say, you're going to do something unethical, what, think about it, versus kind of some of these more subtle prizes. It's not subliminal, because we, they know that, they, but they don't know the connection between them. So it could be interesting. Let me show you the last study, and then we'll have, I think we'll have a good amount of time to discuss, too. Last study is going to reverse our causality here. And the reverse of causality is you you are have a goal, and your goal is to be here unethically, to lie. And so how are you going to think about network activation in this situation? Okay. And so we have about 50 Duke participants. Um, and the design, so these are, I think, mostly students. Our other one was working adults. So as psychologists, we're very proud of having working adults, I forgot to say. Um, so the, um, this, this one is uh, 
just simply manipulate whether you're in an honest condition or in an overly positive condition, and our DV is going to be what network do you activate, what's the structure that you activate. So this is what we're going to do to you. We're going to put you in a situation where you have a completely boring task for engaging. You're going to engage in that boring task. And now what you have to do is you have to explain to your friend, to, to your, the next participant, a fellow student, that this is a really wonderful task. It's a great, exciting task. And you're, you're, you're going to be put in this. And this is the classic uh, uh, paradigm in cognitive dissonance that, that we borrow for this one. So um, they know they're going to have to lie about it. And before they're lying, what they're going to do is they have to just, on related task, come up with your network contact. And the dependent variable they're going to look at is density. So how dense is the network that they activate? And so this is just a quick way. This is so you're either assigned to uh, randomly assigned to activate positive or or overly positive message or honest evaluation of the task. Generate your network, and they actually write a message to the other participant. They complete their DBs um, and and assess the relationships among the five people who they've activated. So. Here's our boring task. And so the boring task is they have to do this 20 trials. They got to either put a smiley face if the columns are the same. So look at these numbers. And so let me assess whether, okay, I see a 7.64. It's, yeah, it's over there, 7.65. Yeah, and I go through all of it. And yes, it's the same. And then I look over here, the next uh, matrix that I have, and I have to see if the task, the number's the same. And in fact, it's different over here. And so they do this 20 20 painful times they have to do it, okay? And Trump and Lieberman find that it is sufficiently boring and uh, miserable. And um, we, we then, what we do is then we have to have them activate their networks. And so you, I, I don't think I need to do this with you guys, but um, the, the density is, of course, the, so the, la, the gender paper was just the number of ties. This is density, so it's um, the, the number of ties among the altars and you divide it among the total ties. And so this would be a density of 0.2 in this network, um, and the other network is a much more dense network of 0.7. So the, the interconnections between the ties. And so here what we find is that the people who are told that they got a line, overly positive condition, this is the density scores, they're activating networks that are much more sparse than the people who are in the honest condition. I'm honest, and so I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm fine to activate my click. It doesn't matter that those are people who are coming to mind. And the people who know they're going to have to lie, they're sitting there thinking about people who may not be able to put the two and two together. So they haven't told their lie yet. They're in a psychological state preparing for the lie. We ask them the network questions then, and they're activating these very different networks. And so here's the part I like about this study. Okay, so the question is, you know, it's a black box, what's going on in people's heads. Okay, why, where does network activation come from? And so what we want to do is we want to say is, Network activation comes from emotion. And so we ask people to answer the PANAS, the positive negative aspect fail, which is often put in psychological studies. And we add in a few questions of our own, which are around ethical uh, feelings. So um, I'm feeling unethical, I'm feeling immoral, I'm feeling guilty, inappropriate, liable. And that, those items form a scale. And what we find, even in our small sample size, is uh, a mediation. The, uh, trend. And so uh, what I've shown you already is if you anticipate telling a lie, you're more likely to activate a sparse network. So you're, uh, I've got a lie, I'm going to come up with that loose network. Um, and then what we also find is a correlation where if I, of course, this is not rocket science here, if I'm anticipating telling a lie, I'm going to feel more guilty. But what is interesting is that guilt is what is predicting the sparse network, and it explains away the, the relationship above so the, the effects uh, of guilt seem to be mediating um, the sparse network. Okay, so that's what we are we are seeing in our experiment too, and we are finding already main effects in our uh, people who are in the honest condition. You're told you get to be honest. You're coming up with people who are rating as more. You're also rating as more honest. So you're thinking about people who are honest. You guys who are going to have to lie. You're thinking about people, or at least you're saying afterwards they are more dishonest. Um, the status of the ties. This was a status effect we did not predict. What we found was in the honest condition, people activated younger people. And so maybe their, their cliques are people who are their close friends. We were What we were thinking is that you would, I wouldn't want to activate my mother when I got alive, right? And so you don't want to think about older people who can 
professor who can watch you, judge you, and give you strong notes. But what we, what we find is actually is, is, is not the status effect that we think, but your click is probably people who are your, your, your social group, et cetera, and you're, you're lying to somebody who is in that social group anyway. Uh, Self-monitoring didn't moderate. And we find the women are driving our effects. So we find a very strong interaction where the women who have to lie are the ones who are quickly activating these um, uh, loose networks uh, versus their click. And I think if we did status manipulation, we could get some of these effects where the high power people may drive a lot of this um, kind of differentiation. They're not going to think about their click, and they're going to strategically, motivationally come up with these networks. So let me let me just um, two more slides to close with, and then we can we can maybe discuss a little bit. Um, so I anticipate having to be dishonest, and so what what do I do? I'm going to activate a social structure that's going to help me facilitate that goal. And so we create social, and we're imagining creating social environments that are allowing us to do the things we want to do. And what is what is creating it? It's an emotional reaction. The, the feelings that we have seem to be underlying the networks we're coming up with. Um, I think Ned presented new data as well, where feelings of, of being in control and being comfortable, emotion was predicting the, the network structures being activated. The second thing we, we find is this very interesting judgmental, judgment and decision-making bias, which is the illusion of invulnerability. invulnerability. I feel overconfident. I'm doing unethical things when I feel overconfident about it. And we have a network explanation for that. And what we are saying is the reason why people may feel overconfident is they're strategically coming up with networks that convince them they can get away with things. Okay. And I forgot to mention, we do have a question which we ask, to what extent can you get away with do you think you can get away with uh, the, the unethical need? And people are more likely to say that when they've activated the sparse network. And then we have questions in terms of how can we start to correct unethical behavior? Maybe whenever we have an exam to give our students, what we should do is make them think about the dense networks around them. Maybe we should get them to think about, activate the professors in their minds so, or, or their parents, et cetera. So maybe we can use those manipulations to, 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 to create more ethical behavior as well. So we kind of frame it in a negative way, but maybe there's some more positive ways we can look at it. And so let me close with a few um, implications for, our, for the research that we have here. So I've written a paper with Sally Blount, which is on knowledge transfer. And in the paper on knowledge transfer, what we've argued is that there's many ways we can think about why people um, come up with, with evaluate ideas. There are rational, random, and relational perspectives. And I want to do a similar kind of analysis with respect to network activation. Some people kind of conceive of network activation as something that is more, uh, rational. When I'm asked this network survey, what I'm doing is rationally, carefully, sifting through my contacts, evaluating who is most relevant, who is most important, and then coming up with what is really uh, a, a fair view of the social structure that I'm embedded in. On the other hand, there's a more random perspective, and the rational people paradoxically are also kind of bottom of the random perspective as well. They see errors and they say, hey, it, it's, it's random error that's going on. And so maybe there's this random process going on where I'm just chance-based, like a garbage can model, coming up with problems, and the people who come to mind get kind of matched, and, and that's how networks are activated. And our argument is that network activation is neither rational nor random. What it is is psychological, and we need to understand the psychology by which we are um, activating our networks. And so we have heuristics, and the heuristics are shortcuts, little quick tools that we're using to come up with people and relationships. We have frames that are affecting us, things that are priming me to think about how do I feel at a given moment, things that are priming me to think about how do I think about the situation that I'm trying to confront, and we have motivation my own ego, my own goals that are telling me, I want to see my social structure in a way that allows me to do the things that I want to do. And so these are some of the psychological ways that can structure the way we, we are activating and thinking about our social relationships. So just to close, my, my, the thing that I found most interesting is in the research area, is kind of looking at very monolithic forces like culture and networks that we assume are so stable. Asians are this way, Americans are this way, you have a dense network, you have a sparse network, and really, really looking at what appears to be acceptable error. And that acceptable error that is there, rather than kind of putting it under the rug, as, as Kuhn talks about it, maybe we should look at the error 
and try and say, maybe these errors are a signal of a paradigm shift. Um, and we need, we need theory to account for that data. So that's my, my um, kind of the way I'm trying to think about this research. And thank you so much. And if, if there's any comments, questions, we're still in the process of designing it, especially for people who have really, really studied networks. And you know, you're like, geez, what is this psychological person talking about? It doesn't make any sense. Please tell me. Sort of a more theoretical network, uh, complex network question, but um, I, I, and help me bring you a so, so correct me on the details. I believe I heard that suppose you need to distribute some sort of um, a vaccine when you vote or not, you can just go to any random person and say, give this vaccine to someone, and you're more likely to get a more highly connected person. Is that how that goes? Or you, you say, give it to someone who's more connected. Yes, so like a broker or something, so like you know, the Milgram and small world stuff? Sort of like that. Yeah, yeah. and it's, is it you are really more likely to find out if you think about people that have two steps away Okay. Oh, so there's two steps away from the world? Well, one of my... Well, sort of so, 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 so speaking now about network topology, like on a, on a complex network approach, if if the and, and you have to know much more about the individual networks, not just you know are these two people friends, but I wonder if, if if you could prime someone to optimize that or to optimize going the other direction, um, and that that's kind of a, that's what we're really interested in actually. So what we are interested in is that I think Ned mentioned this before, which is the idea of people squandering their networks, waste, right, in the network. And so the idea is, if this is how people are activating their networks based on situational cues, etc. It's not necessarily optimal. It's just based on whatever cue happens to be available at a particular moment. And what we argued in our other paper is that the networks that you see the low status people activating are not really helpful. They're activating clicks that's not helping them get a job. And furthermore, those are the people who are most desperately in need of resources at this time, and so they're going to be most hurt by these. So the idea of how do we optimize the network so that we can activate the right network for the right situation rather than just a network I feel like at a given moment. That's really, really interesting to us. And if the lowest status people in our society are the ones who are paying the price, it, it's very interesting. And it's Especially, I think, a different way of thinking about networks than what you see in network classes. So if you go to the MBA classrooms, what they'll often tell you is the classic, you know, build a bigger network or, um, or make more structural holes in your network. And what we are saying is optimize the way you think about the network, right? So you have this bigger network structure, you have different subsections, you're not thinking about the whole complete thing. And so how are you going to be, you know, do you maybe there's smart viewers? Right? And so that's what's really interesting to us, which is squandering versus just adding the network, coming up with different, so the different strategic perception. So in looking at kind of your three different, the three different interpretations of you know, how network activation works, the rational management of the black people, I'm wondering where um, the, like, the actual comes into play. So I'm thinking of, like I'm actually working with some data where um, I have some uh, egos who are um, relying on, I would say that their, in, their personal information networks are highly constrained and that they're suggesting that they would go to kind of one person for multiple issues. Um, so they're, rel they're heavily reliant on them. And it turns out that those people are the ones that have the smallest networks and they tend to rely heavily on stuff that they communicate frequently. So there's this kind of like effect of convenience and the fact that the personal networks are in VI, like at least in their, you know, in terms of the people that they need are constrained. So it's not a rational approach necessarily because they may have more people that they can kind of. It's psychological. I'm so happy to say it. It is psychological, mm -hmm. right? So what it is is an example of the availability heuristic. So the availability heuristic is just by the fact that you are, and we know this in, in the geography of networks, right? So the fact that you and I sh share the same office. Okay, or, or, or right next door to each other. The fact that 
I happen to be the person with the office next to the bathroom, right? Then just for that availability, just for that convenience, just because I'm not thinking in a broad way about my opportunity, you come to me. So it is an example of availability. I, I go to who is available. Not just I think about who's available, I also socially, so I think about them and I socially actually go to them. Now, do you ever intend, because it seems to me that the one slide is the one that I think I think I made at this question when this was to you about, because you're never, it's all lab experiments, and you're never actually getting a sense for what their networks are actually about, the yes. potential network. It's That's just right. a matter of, they have an idea of what that potential network is, and then they activate certain parts of it, you know. Um, so, because I'm wondering if... What's real here? Yeah, is it all perceptual? How do we grab yeah. this thing? I mean, it could be that the people that... Because, I mean, again, my, my members are self-reported, so essentially I don't have that measure of their actual network either, but, like, it's a... It's a... Yeah, so it's like... It's a hard question, right? So it's a really hard question. And so um, I think anybody who's doing self-reported network stuff will say the stuff that we're presenting here is all relevant. Some of the more observational stuff, like email networks, okay, that may be a better assessment of the potential member, but I would argue even that network structure, you know, I, there, there's certain people I email, but it underrepresents all the other channels of communication I use to get to them, right? So I go by their office, I talk to them. Um, so you, you're really not getting a complete network there either, okay? So we don't have an assessment of their potential network, and I think it's hard to, to get that. And so you can have these really, really long network surveys that, that kind of, so we have used the really, the, the quickest snapshot. So our name generators are like five, like, like GSS, but mostly 10 mm -hmm. people, right? So it's just literally snapshots. But, you know, there's more extensive network surveys, but I would argue, and they, I guess, what if they say, yeah, I guess, um, in, in Toronto, Wellman has talked about what the average size of a person's network is. Like people can actually have about 100. Can I remember 100 people? Maybe hard to do that, right? right. The, the, the missing, um, I would say, like, playing kind of devil's advocate, like, wanting to look to this would be like, well, like, what's, or, no, no, but what are the implications of, so I'm naming people, um, I'm activating names, and perhaps I'm kind of doing this, like, upward, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm naming people that are higher status to me that can be more beneficial for like jobs or for whatnot. Um, but what if I'm naming people that are really don't have that much potential or having fantasy? Yeah. I mean, fantasy. So on the one hand, you could argue, well, it's past, like you're putting yourself in a positive frame of mind, so it's kind of like you know that um, well, it's just like positive thinking will lead to kind of like positive outcomes or actions. But on the other hand, it could just be an absolutely fantastic network that is really like is not a reasonable network in terms of actual self. So we have two answers to this. What kind of fantasy we do not think is really an issue in this? Okay, so if I imagine my network contains Brad Pitt, George Clooney, um, I don't think that's an issue. Okay, because that level of fantasy is not captured in the data. Because I'm asking you, who are the people you thought of in the last six months? Okay, but the fact is, there is a systematic upward push in the network. If you know the research Noah was talking about, the research that the hypothesis we have about um, status and networks, um, yeah, they would be reporting that. And I think that is a real caution to taking these self reported measures at face value because that is the psychology of people's desires to feel important, to feel, to show and communicate that they are socially connected. Think about it. Think about how this, like if a consultant or a boss is coming in, people want to say, I'm in the flow of things. I am connected to these important people, and so these are there can be the systematic skew in the network from an experiment. So, so I'm all for believing that this is, and that's part of that phenomenon. But I don't think it's a real problem for the way we are measuring it because we are randomly assigning people to different conditions, and by randomly assigning them to them, what we are able to do is control the the what is normally just random variation. Okay, so I can put you in a psychological state where you're feeling um, narcissistic and then you start fantasizing and reporting all these high status people. I can put you in a state where you don't have confidence and control and maybe like our women in our study where they're you know, reporting a little bit uh, more constrained network. Is that it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any to come up with these um, 
Okay, we did measure timings. So we did it on a computer. Um, and so in our, in our this study, we have time measures. And so, yeah, we don't have the time that the, the prime lasted, but we did measure how long it took them. And so in, in these studies where we, that those primes, uh, sorry, that, that I showed you where it was the network primes, what we found was actually kind of interesting. So the sparse and the dense primes, I don't believe there was difference between these two in terms of how long people took to come up with it. We were thinking, you know, dense primes should be faster because you come up with a group that's all similar. The one that took people a lot of time, longer than both of these, was our control condition, where we didn't constrain it. And so maybe it was it was less guiding them through, and so there were more mental choices they were having to make. And so that one took them the longest, the control, which is not up here, which is just think of the, the so it was, it's kind of saying, what, Who's relevant? That's kind of maybe what they were asking. So I think that's true. So I think that I think that the you know so the, what is what really got me interested in networks is the culture research. Because what is called a dense network in network theory is, a collect, is the value of collectivism. So networks is, is really a, a, a sociological way to talk about psychologists. And we've always been talking about values, beliefs. This is the structure that's associated with those values. So dense networks is like collectivism. And sparse networks is much more associated with individualism. With the timing is, aspect, what I think is really interesting is we know that if we, if we make people answer quickly, that, um, that, that they are going to be using more heuristics. So giving people, and so this is known from the psychological research, um, need for closure and other things. So you make constrain people, give them uh, very little bit of time, they may be using much more heuristics and kind of making uh, a lot of these errors. But I don't, I don't know if that's surprising, but we could kind of see these things. I think I'm at 12.30 and I don't want to stand between lunch or grabbing more chocolate or anything like <laughs> that. But, um, well. Thank you again very much. Thank you.